All right, my friends, I want to take a few minutes to talk about step up in basis. That's what we're going to talk about. It's an incredibly important understanding for you to know when it comes to your estate planning and the tax ramifications thereof. And before you say you don't have much of an estate, I'm telling you right now, do not go away from this video because it's critically, critically important. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Just have some assets, and I'm going to show you exactly how this works. So welcome to Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel, place you come to learn most tax-efficient strategies out there during your life or as part of your estate to transfer to your heirs. So let me get out my uh, trusty markers here. And I had a, we're working with a lady today, Miss Sharon, and uh, we're talking about the various strategies. And I, I could tell it's kind of... Um, Maybe talking a little bit above her in terms of the uh, the ramifications of various planning strategies uh, to leave to her heirs. And so it occurred to me, I better do another video on this to bring it step back a little bit so people can understand because it's incredibly important. I've done videos on this before, but you know, I've got over 500 videos. So if you haven't seen this, the other videos I've done, I won't blame it. So let's talk about it. So there's three types of accounts that you have. You have a taxable tax deferred and a tax free. All right, so you got those three types of accounts. 401k, 403b, 457, TSP, IRA. That's your tax deferred and even annuity that's your tax deferred. I know my handwriting is pretty bad there, but uh, you can see that, I think. Yeah. All right, then you got your tax free, and the only tax free you have is Roth, well, municipal bonds, and then life insurance. I'm not, I don't care too much about municipal bonds. I'll show you why in just a second. Then you got your taxable. Could be anything. CD, could be, uh, I don't know. Brokerage account, uh, stocks, bonds. I mean, literally, it could be anything. Anything in here. What happens is, on a taxable account, you'll get a 1099 at the end of the year. In some ways, municipal bonds could, the same thing could factor into that. But I'm just saying, in terms of the tax-free, municipal bonds are tax-free. So we're going to put it in this bucket. It's just not that important for what we're going to talk about. But anyway, a taxable account, you get a 1099. It could be a qualified dividend. It could be a regular dividend. It could be a real estate investment trust, or R -R -E-I-T, a -E -I -T, or REIT. Uh, could be interest from a CD, interest income, qualified dividend income, dividend income, long-term capital gain, short-term capital gain, and taxable interest. So you get taxable interest, LTCG, long-term capital gain, STCG, uh, short-term capital gain, um, dividends, qualified dividends, and then real estate investments. I guess that's it. Any other income, I can't think of anything else. So this is, you get a 1099 each and every year. Now, will you get a 1099 on a municipal bond? Eh. So it's, again, I don't, I don't want to focus on municipal bonds, but just don't yell and say, oh, municipal bond, I don't care. All right, so 1099 will get on this taxable account. There's no 1099 here because you don't pay any taxes until you take a distribution. And then you'll get a 1099, but only once you take a distribution. Here you get a 1099 if it pays any kind of dividends, long-term capital gain, or taxable interest. Here there's no 1099 either on tax-free. No 1099. So that's how you kind of separate those three assets. Tax deferred, you will pay tax at some point, but you got a tax deduction on the front end typically. Not with an annuity, all right? Annuity, don't get any tax deductions on the money going in. Uh, not with a non-deductible IRA either. I was talking to a guy today who makes too much money to put into a Roth. So we're talking about non-deductible IRAs. It still falls in the tax deferred account. But when he takes a distribution from that non-deductible IRA, the portion, the 5,500 that he put in, he'll get tax free. But still, it's not the, quite the same thing because it still falls in the tax deferred bucket. All right. So let's, so far, so good. Taxable, tax deferred, tax free. All right. So let's keep going here because it's important. So now from an heir's perspective, what would you rather get? Would you rather get, we'll just say tax, I should probably, deferred, tax free, or tax a bull? 
And this is the financial planning software I use, Right Capital. It breaks it down in terms of these three buckets too. It gives you a tax allocation percentage of tax deferred, taxable, and tax free. It's freaking awesome. Probably some of my favorite parts of the financial planning software that Right Capital provides is that one chart right there. I love it. So your mom just died. Which do you rather get? You well, know, obviously, let's just say it's a hundred thousand bucks a piece. All right, for, for simplicity. Well, obviously, you'd rather get tax free. All right, tax free does you don't pay any tax. It's inherently tax free. The second one would be this right here. In fact, I'd even say between the two, they're essentially the same. All right, it depends on the investments in there. I get it, but from a tax perspective, to you, these are the exact same. It's not taxed here, and it's not taxed there. There's completely non-tax to either when you inherit the account from your mom. This one is taxed at whatever your interest rate is, all right? whatever your tax bracket is. So if you're in a 10% tax bracket, you're only gonna net 90K. That's how it works. So we do not want tax deferred accounts to transfer to your heirs, we don't. Now, let's show you something else, all right? So, that's how the buckets work. We want tax-free and we want taxable to transfer to your heirs without question. Let me show you something else though. All right, we're growing, we're moving, we're moving. What if you put 50 bucks into BRKB? That's Berkshire Hathaway, the class B shares, BRKB. I have no idea what the price is, but just say you put $50,000 uh, 50, in there. And it grew to a hundred, you know, say two hundred thousand dollars. All right, so fifty k grows to two hundred thousand dollars, and then you get hit by a bus. That is the account value at your date of death, a DOD valuation, date of death valuation. Just as a side note, if you're looking at brokerage firms, you want to find out will they give you an accounting for date of death valuations. USA wasn't doing that for a while. It actually infuriated me. USA said, we're not going to provide the date of death valuations. I said, wait a second. They hold the money in USA as a custodian. How could you not provide date of death valuations? Especially on a fee-based account where the client was paying a fee. It's insane. And they kind of changed, they kind of wishy-washed it and they kind of changed it, but as you had to go through this huge rigmarole. It's insane. They, they finally smartened up. But if you find, if you ask your brokerage firm, your custodian, do you provide date of death valuations? And they say, no, I'm just telling you, look for someplace else. The reason being, because date of death valuations are what you're going to use for your estate planning to appraise your estate. How much was the state estate worth at your date of death? Everything is based on that from the state tax and on top of that, an income tax perspective as well, because simply when they inherit money, it's based on a date of death valuation on how much the inheritor, the heir, has to potentially pay. So as your brokerage account, ask them, do you do date of death valuations? If they say no, find someplace else. All right, so here we start with $50,000. It's worth $200,000 now. This is in a taxable account, a brokerage account. You drop 50K into Warren Buffett and you say, Warren, you did a great job. You quadrupled my money. It's worth $200,000. You die. How much tax is due to you, little Miss Janie when she inherits that? Again, it's a brokerage account, a taxable account. The answer is zero tax. That 150K of unrealized capital gain is free and clear to little Miss Janie there. She gets the entirety of the account completely tax free. That's called the step up basis. I cannot stress how important this is. I cannot stress the reason you need to understand the three different modes of transferring assets, tax free, tax deferred and taxable. Tax deferred is the worst. Tax free is the best. And tax free includes in this case, taxable brokerage accounts. She pays nothing, nothing on that, nothing whatsoever. Now, let's just say you make a mistake and you give Miss Janie the, the account before you die. Ugh. Don't do this. And I'll probably do another one on this specifically. So now you put 50,000 in as your cost basis. We're at 200,000 now. You haven't died, but you're thinking you're going to die. And you say, oh, Janie, I don't want this to have to go through probate, so I'm just going to give you the shares. And then two weeks later, you die. So Janie owns this now. Two weeks later, you die. What's her tax on that? What 
when she sells this property at two hundred thousand dollars, she'll owe one hundred fifty thousand dollars of income of capital gain tax, long term capital gains tax on that. Because what happens when you gift a property, you gift it while you're alive. You're gifting the cost basis with it. And the cost basis here is $50,000. So again, let me just be very clear. I have a $50,000 Berkshire Hathaway stock. It could be anything. It could be my house. It could be anything I want. And I say I have two options. I want Janie to get it. So I'm going to give it to Janie while I'm alive. And then when I, Janie could do whatever she wants. She didn't have to wait for I die. She just could sell the very next day. When she sells it though, she will pay long-term capital gain, unless it's a short-term capital gain, but in this case, long-term, on the difference between the account value and how much it's worth. I don't even have to die. It just says at the end of the day, I give it to you, Janie, and Janie sells it. She's gonna pay capital gain tax on $150,000. On the other hand, if I wait till I die and give it to her via inheritance, either through a trust or either through a state probate, i.e. through uh, my will, no tax, none, because when you inherit a property, it's tax-free. That $150,000 of unrealized capital gains is completely wiped away. I just cannot stress that enough. So if you think there's a reason to give a property, that's fine, but make sure there's a reason, not just to avoid probate, because if you're giving a property away in order to avoid probate, you're, uh, you're giving a huge tax hit as well. That's, that's just a fact. Secondly, on top of that, municipal bonds. There's no growth in municipal bonds. Municipal bonds do not grow. I'll do another episode on that specifically. But municipal bonds are not what you want in a taxable account. It's simply because there's no growth there. You want, especially if you're looking at leaving assets to heirs, you don't want tax-free bonds because they don't grow. They give you interest. That's it. But there is no growth of principal whatsoever. So you're not taking advantage of a step-up in basis because a step-up in basis only really works if there's a growth from the initial cost basis you put in to the account value at your date of death. A municipal bond, you put 100,000 bucks in, it's worth 100,000 bucks. That's how it works. It's worth 100,000 bucks. There is no growth. No matter if you die tomorrow, or if you die 20 years from now, the municipal bond will not have any appreciation. So people say, I'm going to have tax free and to transfer to my kids tax free. Oh, that's the worst possible estate planning. Not the worst, but that's a bad estate planning move. We want your heirs to inherit accounts that have grown in value. Berkshire Hathaway stock, I'm just using that for example. Could be McDonald's stock, I don't care, but we want them to inherit stuff that has grown, that way they can inherit it without paying any tax on the unrealized gain. Municipal bonds do not serve that purpose whatsoever. Life insurance is a completely different thing, and I'm not gonna talk about that here today, but your growth heavy stuff that you want your kids to inherit, put that in your, IR, in your taxable account, your non-IRA. Your municipal bonds, get rid of them outright and buy traditional bonds inside your IRA to get a higher yield. Absolutely. The difference between a municipal bond and a government bond, the government bonds probably going to yield a you know, full 25 to 30% more. And it's all coming out as ordinary income anyway. So that's, I don't want to get too much of that. But don't transfer municipal bonds via your will through a taxable account because there is no step-up basis, especially if you have a Berkshire Hathaway inside your IRA that's growing like gangbusters. You're just uh, you're going to give them a tax consequence, so you get no tax benefit of the municipal bond on a taxable account when they when you die, and you give a huge tax liability on the Berkshire Hathaway stock in your IRA. Ah, don't do that. I'll do another video tomorrow uh, going over this uh, strategy here. I just want to in introduce you to the concept of step-up basis and give you some things to think about when it comes to your own estate plan. So if you like what you see, subscribe, comment, questions, concerns, as always, put them down there. And then don't forget to give me a thumbs up for sure. And then uh, go to the blog at heritagewealthplanning.com and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.